Hello everyone. Welcome to today's residential DHW Heating with a Boiler webinar, a one hour, one PDH credited presentation. My name is Miranda Getling and I'm the Wiesman Academy Manager. I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for attending today. We appreciate you attending this webinar despite what we are all going through. Today, your webinar instructor will be Jody Samuel. Jody is a graduate of Maine Maritime Academy with a degree in marine engineering. Over the past 20 plus years, he has worked with various companies, including Amtrol, Wiesman, and Kalefi, serving in various roles, including application engineer, product manager, training manager, and manager for engineering education. Currently, he serves as project development manager for Wiesman. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. As stated, this is a one PDH credited presentation. If you indicated upon registration that you would like to receive this credit, the RCEP provider has a mandated survey to be completed that I will email out to you once this webinar concludes. If you don't remember if you marked that you want the PDH credit when you registered for this webinar, feel free to email me. My email will be on the last slide once we get to the end of this webinar. Due to the current situation, we will be sending out the certificates via email within the next five business days. If you would like a hard copy, feel free to let me know and I'll make sure to have that done as soon as possible. Everyone will stay muted throughout the webinar. However, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. On the left side is the desktop laptop version and on the right is the mobile device version. Jody will be stopping about halfway through the presentation and at the end to answer any questions submitted, so feel free to pop anything that you have to ask in there at any time. This webinar will be recorded and it will be posted on our video library within the next two weeks, which is located on the same website you went to to register for this webinar, the Wiesman Academy website. Once you are in that video library, you will select the recorded webinars section, and then you will have to hit the discover more button about two times for all of the videos to populate. Like I said, it should be up within the next two weeks, so at that time you are able to go back and rewatch it at your convenience. With that being said, let's begin. Here is Jody Samuel. Thanks, Miranda. So uh, today we're gonna talk about domestic hot water. I'm glad to have you all with you with us. So a couple of housekeeping slides before we begin. Uh, so Miranda mentioned about RCP, RCEP, and that's who we do our uh, CEUs through. Uh, a lot of times a question comes up about the um, presentation. It is copyrighted. If you do want a copy of it, when you fill out the survey, just mention it in there and we can send you a PDH. Now, a couple of slides here. Uh, the purpose, I'm actually gonna jump through because the purpose and the learning objectives are uh, pretty closely uh, related. So uh, our learning objectives is when we finish up, you'll be able to contrast the differences between an indirect water heater and a combi boiler and how they meet a hot water demand. You'll be able to compare the sizing processes for combi boilers and indirect water heaters, and they are different. Describe the pros and cons of using a combi boiler and an indirect water heater. And then the wild card, you know, as a third option, describe how a domestic hot water storage tank loading system works and the advantages of this type of system. Now, uh, this presentation actually didn't start off as one. This actually was something that kind of fell out of uh, sitting in a meeting about combi boilers. And uh, to be truthful up front, uh, my position on um, domestic hot water is every water heater has its place in the market, but given the options out there, if it's possible, I will always go with an indirect water heater over any other method out there, just so you know that. So that's kind of where my discussion is going. But from that from that sitting down and discussing, talking about com combi boilers, I stated that position out there. And of course, um, you know, our president's like, well, why? Can you, know, can you give me the reasons? So this became from give me the reasons to explain it in talking points. And lo and behold, about two and a half years later, now it's a presentation talking about the subject. So really gonna, we're gonna really examine the, uh, the water heating methods, uh, excuse me, of uh, doing a combi boiler, doing a, an indirect, and then also throwing something in about this domestic hot water storage tank loading system. Those of you out there who do Visma will know this as the, the, the 222 veto dens. Um, now from a discussion standpoint, I always like to have something to come back to for a lot of the calculations. So let's talk about a home that we're going to put domestic hot water in. So we have a, a building and, and somebody did a heat loss on it. 
this happens to be right soft. This is a software package I've used in the past. And let's call the heat load of the building 75,000 BTUs per hour. So that's one of the numbers we're gonna to have to look at when we look at the domestic hot water uh, loading of the system. Now the, the decision is already made to go with a condensing boiler. So they really haven't, we haven't made the decision on which style of condensing boiler, but we know that we're going in that direction. We know from looking at the plans of the house, what the water heating needs are. So this is a four bedroom house, again, 75,000 BTUs per hour, and it has two and a half bathrooms. Among these two and a half bathrooms, there are two showers, one bath, four sinks, one washing machine, and one dishwasher. And each one of these represent a hot water loading. To the right-hand side, I have a couple of items that are listed as in gallons per minute, um, we look at the hot water usage. Sometimes we talk in gallons per minute. Sometimes we talk in gallons per hour. That comes in. That's important when we look at the water heating methodology. But this is what we really have to work up against. Then the question becomes, all right, so how do I want to approach the water heating? Because there are a lot of methods. And in fact, these methods can be sliced and diced in a lot of different directions. I tend to look at it right off the gate when I look at water heating as, is it indirect or is it direct heating? So direct fired are water heaters that the heat source is directly heating the water. So I have a uh, flame here heating the water in this instantaneous water heater, or here I have the flame heating the water directly in the storage tank water heater. And even with electric water heaters, I have electricity heating an electric element that directly heats the water. So these are direct methods. When I go indirect fired, the domestic water isn't really in contact with the source of heat. So over here, I have a tank styled indirect water heater. Hot water from the boilers pass through the coil indirectly heating my domestic hot water. And over here, I have a plate heat exchanger, again, where the boiler water passes through and generates the hot water. Now, when we look at indirect fired methods, there's a lot of um, advantages to it. Um, you know, you could throw out advantages, anything from, you know, overall best utilization of the heating system boiler. You know, I paid for this boiler, let's run it for 12 months a year rather than six months a year. You know, I operate the boiler through the middle of summer. That way there, when I get into the heating season, um, I don't have to worry about starting up this boiler that hasn't operated for six months and maybe it won't start up. It could be a discussion about both of these methods of being hooked to a condensing boiler, the high efficiency, it could be the fact that my local utility is incentivizing this style of water heater. It could be that uh, from an aesthetic standpoint, if I couple the water heating into the boiler plant, there's only one exhaust going outside of the building. There's probably another half a dozen other ones that could also be utilized. Um, but uh, for our discussion, we're going to go to the indirect fire method because of the fact that in this building, we are gonna have a heating boiler that we can couple it with. Now, when we start to do domestic hot water, you know, although both methodologies of a, of a combi boiler and a tank style indirect are connected to a boiler, there's a lot different methodology in looking at the application of these, and particularly the size sink. So when we look at domestic hot water, when we look at providing for the building, the approaches always come down to two things, recovery and storage. Storage is to have the water available on hand to, to draw against, to uh, provide that hot water. Whereas recovery, recovery, think of it as on demand. Uh, there is no storage on, on the, the far end. So when I need hot water, I have to produce the hot water as it's being used. And when we look at water heating, you can run the entire spectrum where I have methodologies that's all recovery, pure on demand type water heating versus methods that are almost all storage. When I think of all storage, I think of electric water heaters because of the fact that it normally is maybe a five kilowatt element in that electric water heater, or it could be somewhere in the middle. For our discussion, you'll notice I have two orange circles here. One about all recovery. When I look at a combi boiler, it's an all recovery method of generating hot water. So we have to approach it as such. Whereas if I do a tank style water heater, it's somewhere in between the extremes. There's gonna be a storage component to it, and there is also going to be a recovery component to it as well. <coughs> What's important is when I look at this from a standpoint of applying these, if I'm sizing the water heater, the methodology does change when I start to look at the different, met 
different methods of delivering the water heat water as well. So let's take a look at where we're going with this. So when I'm if I'm going to supply the domestic hot water, we've decided we're going to do it as part of the boiler system. So I have two choices, the combi or the indirect. As we talked earlier, the combi boiler is an on-demand method. Yeah. Oh, and which really means that there is no storage in the process. So if I have no storage again, it has to be able to provide the right amount of hot water on a per minute and per hour basis based on the firing rate, how much heat I'm putting in there. So when I start to look at the design of the system, if I'm doing combis, I have to be able to look at it from the aspect of the firing rate has to provide enough gallons per minute into the building so that there, everybody is satisfied with the hot water going into that building to provide for whatever method, whatever they're using the hot water with. When I do an indirect storage tank, I have a volume of water here to draw against, but I also have a heat input from the boiler as well. So recovery supplement storage. So I have a, a lot of, I, I can start to look at it as a combined output of that, that water heating method. Now, typically when we do this, because of the combined method here of recovery and storage, usually when you size water heaters, storage type water heaters for residential applications, it's about covering the peak hour. So here I'm looking at how much water I need per hour over here, I'm typically looking at what's the peak amount of energy I need per minute. Now in our discussion, we're gonna first really look at the sizing process first. And I'm gonna start with the combi boiler because it really is really cut and dry compared to uh, the storage water heater. Okay, so combi boiler, no storage to draw against. I need to provide the peak in um, gallons per minute. So the question is always right here, okay? How much hot water is enough? How much hot water do I need? In reality, when I look at doing combi boiler, I have to do an inventory of the fixtures in the house and find out what the peak water usage is going to be for those fixtures. So if I come down here to these fixtures, there's two showers, there's one bath, there's four sinks, a washing machine and a dishwasher. You know, these two showers, we'll call it 1.8 gallons per minute, or if I'm running both of them, it happens to be four. Five gallons per minute for the, the bathtub, four minutes for the sink. So it becomes, well, what, which, what do you think is going to be the maximum combination you see? The more, the bigger the combination, the bigger the combi boiler has to be. In most cases, what somebody would look at and say with this is, you know what? Let's size it based on having the two showers running. Let's go with four gallons per minute as our initial look at domestic hot water. So with that number, I then can go and start to calculate what the input and what the output of that water heater has, to, well, the water heating part of the combi boiler has to be, okay? So I'm sure this formula is uh, familiar to a lot of people, but it really allows me to look at a water requirement in gallons per minute, the delta T of the differential temperature that I'm trying to rise that water up, and I can utilize this to calculate the heat input that's necessary. This formula works in um, domestic hot water. It also one is very familiar to a lot of guys that do calculations for the hydronic heating as well, okay? Now here we've got this number of 500 as a constant. We'll come back in the you know, refresh your memory about this, but where the 500 comes from is the fact that um, over here, this is BTUs per hour. Um, we're dealing with hours here, over here, this is minutes. So part of that 500 is 60, 60 minutes an hour to do my conversion. Over here, it's gallons. Over here, when we talk about BTUs, we talk about pounds of water. The conversion of that is 8.33. So if I measure, multiply 8.33 by 60, I come up with just about 500. And that's where that number comes from. So from our earlier discussion, if my peak demand is four gallons per minute, I can add my four gallons per minute in here. And then I need a delta T. And for our discussion, I'm gonna say it's gonna be a 90 degree delta T. So if I'm looking at the firing rate needed to produce this hot water on demand, I take my 500, I multiply it by my four gallons per minute, I multiply that by 90, I get 180,000 BTUs per hour. And that becomes the output of the boiler to provide domestic hot water, okay? So all of a sudden, I know what I need from a combi boiler standpoint. I need 180,000 BTU output. And with that 180 BTU output, 180,000 BTU output, I can get four gallons per minute. Now, I just want to throw something at you if I come up short in my calculation. 
let's say that we calculated that we need four gallons a minute, but during that one that draw period when both showers are running, let's say somebody decides to do dishwashing down in the kitchen and they're using water at the rate of one gallon per minute. That additional one gallon per minute represents an additional 45,000 BTUs of energy, okay? And you'll find the number for one gallon probably waivers, depending on the delta T, anywhere from about 38,000 to 45,000, depending on the delta T you're looking for. So all of a sudden, if the requirement really isn't four gallons a minute per minute, it's five gallons per minute, I don't need 180,000 BTUs. I need 180,000 plus 45,000 or 225,000 BTUs. The key when I do domestic hot water through a combi boiler, I get what I get and there's no way to stretch it out, okay? What will happen is, and what you'll see with this is if I draw, if I had 180,000, I add in that extra gallon per minute, if I back my numbers out at five gallons per minute, because I can, can work this in both directions, if I have five gallons per minute and 180,000 BTUs, that means that when all, when the two showers are operating in the single sink, I'm not seeing a 90 degree temperature rise, I'm only seeing a 72 degree temperature rise. And all of a sudden, everybody's, the two people are taking the showers in the two bathrooms, temperature's nice and warm, somebody opens up the sink, they feel the temperature drop at the shower. They go from a hot shower down to a lukewarm shower. So when we start to do combi boilers, it's imperative that I know and everybody agrees on the exact gallon per minute. So I take that 180,000, know, that's the output. So it's telling me that for four gallons per minute as the target, generally I'm looking at a boiler input of about 199,000 BTUs, okay? So that becomes my domestic hot water load. Now, quick refresher. My space heating load is 75,000 BTUs per hour. So all of a sudden, when I start to do a combi with domestic hot water, I've increased the size of the boiler over two and a half times, almost two and a half times to, um, to be able to meet the hot water needs. And this is kind of all, a lot of times the issue when I start to look at combi boilers with, with a, a, a fairly hefty domestic hot water demand, the, the domestic hot water demand far exceeds the space heating demand, and that becomes the driver when you start to size with, uh, with combi boilers, okay? So, a couple other things about domestic hot water with a combi boiler. Because there is no storage, because everything is being generated on demand, the combi boiler fires whenever there is a demand. It doesn't matter whether it's a single shower, two showers, or somebody washing their hands in the sink and they desire hot water, the boiler cycles. And those cycles can really start to add up. Okay. Now, the other things that happen is when I start to do, when I do a combi boiler, uh, everything has to be in a priority mode. Priority means that when the call for domestic hot water happens, space heating shuts down and the full output of the boiler goes into generating domestic hot water. When I do an indirect, I also have this option available, but with an indirect, I can take it out as well. And we'll kind of talk about that when we get there. So in, in priority, space heating gets shut off. And that means that if I start to look at long periods of generating hot water, with a combi boiler, since there is no storage to cycle with, you know, you may run with a long period of time without space heating going into the building with this combi boiler. So that is always a concern when I do a combi boiler. Um, the other thing is on the bottom side here, back to here, with it fires with every draw or every demand. Okay. The, what, the combi boiler also, you know, not only has to meet the maximum demands of the building, but it also has to meet the minimum demands. Uh, a number to think about. If I need a half a gallon per minute of flow of hot water, a half a gallon is telling me that the turndown ratio on the boiler has to get the minimum fire down around 20,000 BTUs. 20,000 BTUs will get you in the neighborhood of about a half a gallon per minute. So all of a sudden, when you start to look at something that can go up to 200,000 BTUs, when you start to get the larger combi boilers, large turndown ratios like 10 to 1 is pretty much a must in order to get down to a reasonable low, low flow condition of a half a gallon per minute. 
But when I start to look at sizing the combi boilers, these are the kind of things that come into play in the sizing procedure. Now, when I shift over to a, a storage tank indirect water heater, things start to change because now it's about storage, but it's also about recovery. Now with a storage water heater, I'm not primarily focused on what's required during the peak minute, but it's usually about the peak hour. How do I combine the storage and the recovery to meet the demands of that boiler over what's referred to as the first hour? When we look at boiler indirect water heaters, we talk about first hour ratings, okay? So the first hour rating is a measure of the amount of hot water that can be drawn from a tank in one hour. First hour is a storage type water heaters of indirect and direct fire. So it's a tank rating. Okay. It's a combination of recovery and it's a combination of storage. It is done under an AHRI um, testing protocol. And again, it's a rating of storage and recovery. Okay. And where that first hour comes from is the, the idea that if I have a tank, in that tank I have a certain volume of water. Now, because of the way that when the water comes in the tank and there's a little bit of mixing, generally I can use about 75%, and that's a generic number, not product specific. I can use about 75% of that tank's volume as usable hot water. But then that 75% is also supplemented by the boiler providing hot water through the coil and helping recover the cold water that's coming in to push the performance of the tank well beyond just the volume of the tank itself, okay? Now, from a performance standpoint, generally this is referred to as the first hour rating because the tank's volume is available in that first hour. If I look at a two or a three hour rating, I don't have that volume necessarily available so I can't count on it. So longer performances out of the tank, then we typically shift over to the continuous rating of the water heater, okay? So when I look at tank ratings by AHRI, this is the Air Conditioning, Heating and Refrigeration Institute. There's where our ratings come from. You'll see that we, these tanks always will have a first draw rating, a continuous draw rating, and a first hour rating. Three individual tests, but all three of them are talking about the performance of a single tank. So here's some HRI numbers for various water heaters from 42 to 119 gallons. So the first draw test is simply how much hot water is available at, from the tank without any recovery. So for instance, this 42 gallon tank will give me about 35 gallons of usable hot water. You know, that is a, above the 75% the number because you know, the 75 usually is the, um, the generic number that the industry uses. This is product specific. Look at this one here, the 119 gallon tank under the first test draw conditions. I can get 118 gallons out of it. More than 99% of that is usable hot water, okay? Now, second column is continuous draw rating. So in the test, it's, you know, it's specified the firing rate of the boiler, the, the um, boiler temperature, and also the water flow rate through the coil. And under those conditions that's specified by AHRI, the 42 gallon tank, I can get a continuous 144 gallons per hour um, through that tank. I look at the 119, that's 264 gallons per hour of continuous flow. First hour rating, as we said earlier, this is the one that I'm gonna size off of residentially in most conditions. So that 42 gallon tank can give me 176 gallons of usable hot water. You know, the 119 gallon tank, that's 386, okay? So the question then becomes, if this is how it's rated, how do we choose which one? A lot of different ways of outgoing about sizing. Uh, I'm like everybody, I have a rule of thumb that I use in a, in a pinch to size a water heater. And you, rules of thumb are usually based on experience. There are simple calculations and these are peak hour demand charts. We'll look at those. And then there's long math calculations. Yeah, I use all three of them. I have my rule of thumb. I have my HRI charts. I have my ASHRAE manual if I need to go long for them on it. We're gonna look at the first two just for, for today's discussion. So back to my building, two and a half baths, excuse me, two and a half bathrooms, two showers, one sink, one bath, four sinks, a washing machine and a dishwasher is what we're dealing with, okay? So if I'm using my rule of thumb, usually the rule of thumb is based sometimes on bedrooms, sometimes on occupants, um, sometimes on bathrooms. 
Um, today, I'm just gonna talk about the bedroom or the occupants. The bedroom one is the one I tend to use, where you take the number of bedrooms, you add one to that number, and you add 20. So for instance, we have a four bedroom house, four bedrooms plus one makes it five, five times 20. I'm gonna say, you know, rule of thumb number, I'm probably gonna need about 100 gallons first hour recovery, okay? Now down here, number of occupants times 20 to 35 gallons per person. You know, four bedroom house, married couple, three kids, that's five people. That's about uh, somewhere between, uh, somewhere close to about uh, 100 gallons as well. Down here, number of occupants by 25, a little bit more number here, okay? So if I look at these numbers, all three of these methodologies, I get 100, somewhere between 80 to 140, and 100 down here. So they're all pinning me somewhere about 100 gallons first hour for sizing. Again, these are rules of thumb, kind of get into a ballpark. If I want to start to get more accurate, then I go to uh, methodology like this. This happens coming from AHRI, the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute. DOE has one as well. And I think a lot of manufacturers have these as well. So this is a peak hour demand method. Rather than working off of a rule of thumb based on bedrooms or people or bathrooms, it's all about the amount of hot water that's being used per usage of each one of these. So based on the AHRI numbers, remember down here at the bottom, there are no water conservation methods. They say that your average shower uses about 20 gallons of hot water, okay? Your average shaving uses about two gallons of hot water. If you're doing a hand dishwashing, for instance, it takes four gallons. So we'll take these numbers and we'll multiply it by the number of times used during that hours. So this, this four bedroom house, how many showers are they gonna take on the peak hour? How many baths are they gonna take? So it takes us, you really have to do a survey of how hot water is being used um, in that house. And then we simply multiply it and then add it up to get our total demand down here. So for instance, let's say we talked with the homeowners, they said, you know what? During the course of uh, every, on our peak time, there's gonna be three showers and three showers are gonna use 20 gallons of water. That gives me 60. During that peak time, one of those people are gonna be taking a bath. That's another 20 gallons. So we add that over here. Um, somebody's gonna shave and we're gonna do a hand dishwashing one time. So I get four gallons off the hand dishwashing. I get two off the shave. I add it all up. There's 86 gallons. That's the peak demand based on the anticipated usage. So you see the rules of thumb aren't very far off for, for this example. So now I know from the aspect of how much water has to be delivered in that first hour, I need 86 gallons, okay? So if I come in here back to my tanks, my three different sizes, I'm gonna go over here to the first hour rating. The lowest one I have is 7, 176 gallons. Okay. So if I need a maximum of 86, 176 is certainly more than that, that becomes my choice, okay? Now, when I look at this, a couple of things come into play. This number here, these numbers are based on a certain package that AHRI puts together with the manufacturer to test the tank. It's not the same package that's going into the basement of this house. And in fact, you know, I don't need 176 gallons per hour, so I'm not really even interested in how they did it. What I do know is during the first hour, I can get 35 gallons of hot water out of that tank. So if I have 86 gallons that I need and I can 35 out of the tank, that's telling me I don't need a continuous draw of 144 gallons per hour. I only need a first hour draw of 51 gallons first hour. And if I take that 51 gallons and I convert it over to BTUs, I take my 51 gallons, I multiply that by 500, I multiply that by 90, my temperature rise, that's telling me I need 33,000 BTUs of energy to generate hot water. So quickly, I look at that number there. I look at the boiler that's going in, 75,000. I'm like, well, it's considerably less. So I think I can start to work with this number and coming up with a true boiler size for my application, okay? Now, on the domestic water side, you know, the other thing I have to figure out is how do I set this up to perform? Because when we look at domestic hot water performance, it's about BTUs. It's about gallons per minute and it's about water temperatures. So, you know, most manufacturers, when they have an indirect, you'll see charts like this. This happens to be that 42 gallon tank we're looking at. 
So here's flow rates, 4.4 gallons, 8.8 .8 gallons, 13.2, and 22 gallons. Water temperatures, 158, 176, 194. I'm looking for 51 gallons, first hour. And these are continuous numbers. Excuse me, I want 51 gallons continuous flow. These are continuous numbers. So the lowest performance I have here is producing 86 gallons of hot water. So 86 gallons, I need 65,000 input. I need 4.4 gallons per minute and I need 158 degree water temperature. So I know going in there, I'm probably going to, I'm gonna size the pump for 4.4 gallons per minute. I'm gonna provide a water temperature of at least 158 degrees and I know I'm going to get my 51 gallons per hour. In fact, I don't even need 65,000 BTUs. I only need 33,000 to get the 51 gallons that I'm looking for. So the question then becomes, do I need to upsize the boiler? And if so, how much? Okay. The first answer is if I'm doing priority, I don't. You know, if I have 75,000 BTUs per hour available and I only need 33, if I'm doing priority, I'm not going to upsize the boiler. I'm going to run off a of priority. I'm going to use the, I'm going to be able to put. 65,000 out of the 75 into that water heater, quickly recover it, and I'm gonna have more than enough hot, hot water that's needed, okay? If I'm going non-priority, I have a 75,000 BTU boiler. My peak demand's 86 gallons. And we did through the calculation, as I said, I don't need 65,000, I actually need 33,000. So immediately somebody says, okay, let's add 75 and 33, and that's the size of my boiler, okay? But if I'm trying to reduce the size, there is the option of applying a load factor to be able to right size the application. Uh, this one happens to be a chart that I got from a friend. Um, the other way that I also do it is out of the ASHRAE manual, they have a chart and it actually is, you know, the, the chart number in the ASHRAE manual is applied to the domestic hot water. But this allows me to go in here and based on the domestic hot water load and the space heating load, calculate a load ra a ratio. And based on that ratio, it'll tell me that there's a load factor. So for instance, if my ratio is 0.4, my load factor is 1.29. And I multiply my load by that 1.29 to cover the application. So for instance, if I have 75,000 as my load, space heating load. My domestic hot water load is 33,000. That gives me a load, a ratio of about 0.44. Yeah. That 0.44, let's call it the load factor 1.29. I take my 75,000, I multiply it by 1.29. That's telling me that I need a 97,000 BTU per hour boiler to cover the load. Again, if it's going non-priority. So now I've sized my boiler for the application. Now, where does this leave us in the comparison between the two? Two different methodologies, two different requirements for domestic hot water, two different loads. So if I'm doing a compi boiler and I need four gallons per minute to take care of my domestic hot water load and I have 75,000 BTUs per hour as my space heating load, I'm gonna end up with a 199,000 BTU boiler to cover both loads. If I do an indirect water heater here, and I actually, these are my low, these are actually the loads, not the actual outputs of the boiler, but I'm going to need a boiler with an output of 75,000 with priority. If I'm going non priority, I need 96,000. So, either case, the combi boiler is going to be about twice the size of, at least twice the size of the boiler required when I start to do the, the storage indirect water heater because of how the performance numbers change and the hot water load requirements change as well. So from that side, this is one of the things I tend to look at when I say, you know what, you know, when I start to do domestic hot water off of a tank and a boiler, this becomes one of my driving factors driving me in that direction. So with that being said, we're at a great place to take a break and say, you know, let's take a look, see if we have any questions. So Miranda, anything out there? We do have a question that came in, Jody. 
In looking for increased energy efficiency, what thoughts do you have on using the dual coil model and piping the coils in series to drop the return temps back to the boiler? What can you say are any pros and cons? Um, well, as far as taking a dual coil indirect and type, piping the two coils in series, um, well, if because a lot of times the question comes up about that as far as um, driving more heat through it. Um, residentially and, and standard residential applications, you're probably not going to be able to uh, get any more performance. You know, a, 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 if you have a 199,000 BTU boiler, you're not going to pick up any performance from a, um, a output standpoint or input standpoint by going dual coil. But if you pipe the two in series, you will get a bigger temperature drop However, I'm not sure if the temperature drop is large enough to justify a decent payback on the increased cost of going with the, the dual coil tank. So I'm not sure if, you know, the answer is yes, you will have a performance, in, uh, you'll have an efficiency increase, but I'm not sure if I could, in my, in my mind, cost justify the, the increase in efficiency versus the upfront cost to get you, get you there. So, you know, the answer is yes, it will, but you know, will it pay for itself really is where I stand on that. The next question, what effect on the formula does raising the tank temperature and using a thermostatic mixing valve? Um, I'm actually gonna shelf that because I got a slide on that coming up uh, probably in about, oh, maybe about another 10 to 15 minutes. So that's a great question. We'll talk about that. All right, looks like that is the last question. Okay. So, from, from a standing sizing standpoint, you can see that there is a difference in the sizing process. And generally when I start to look at combi boilers for anything besides a small house, the boiler size a lot of times has to grow to support the combi because of the fact that it doesn't have any storage. And as you saw there, you know, the boiler potentially will grow to be at least twice as large as what was needed with the properly proper sized boiler with uh, the indirect storage water heater associated with it. But when we start to look at a comparison between the two, there, there is a lot of other things that are different from a performance standpoint. And again, from the aspect of my thinking that tends to kind of skew the, the table in the direction of the indirect water heater, okay? So when we start to look at it, the indirect or the on-demand water heater, um, as I said earlier in the presentation, both types of water heater have their place in the market, but if space is, is available, then the indirect can be considered. And really, you know, there, there, there are instances where the indirect does not make sense, okay? Now, when I start to look at the indirect, you know, it's, it's always about a lot of the advantages and actually some of the perceived disadvantages are about the storage. And one of the storage really is, you know, one of the disadvantages here is when I said about footprint, if the space is available. When I do an indirect water heater, that is one more piece of space in the mechanical room that has to be taken up by the boiler. So that is one of the, the pros in, the, in favor of the, the combi boiler over the indirect water heater. Okay. If I do uh, a combi boiler, I'm producing hot water through a heat plate frame heat exchanger. As we said earlier, the boiler has to fire with every draw. So you end up with the boiler, the boiler cycling many, many more times with a combi boiler than you do with a, a storage type indirect water heater. And, you know, because somebody draw, somebody's washing their hands, the hot water comes on. If they draw hot water to fill a pot, it comes on. If somebody takes a shower, you know, you go through that litany of everything out there and everything that would use hot water has that boiler firing. Okay. So it has its place in the market. And you know, to me, this is some of the criteria when somebody says, should I do an indirect, uh, do a combi boiler? You know, my first thing is, well, do you have space for the indirect? And like, well, we really don't. I'm like, well, let's start talking combi. Tell me about the bathrooms. Well, we got a bath to a bath and a half. Amelia, I'm thinking bath to bath and a half. I can probably carry the load with a combi at about maybe 150,000 BTUs or maybe less. So then it becomes, yep, you know what? This could be a, a great application for the combi boiler. And again, from a combi standpoint, you know, what's your draw rate? You know, if your peak draw is in that range of maybe three and a half to 
you know, again, you can get away with a combi boiler in the range with an input of about 150,000. It shouldn't be significantly oversized for the application. But again, you know, these three bullets usually are my discussion points with somebody when they ask about a combi boiler as far as whether I do a combi or whether I do an indirect water heater. And this is the area where the combi boiler does shine. Okay. Now, with the combi boiler, as we said earlier, it is all about um, performance. It's all about input. So when I look at a combi boiler, I'm always going to deal with the output of the boiler. And this is kind of where my 150, 150,000 number came from. I have a 150,000 B2 boiler. The uh, boiler's output's probably going to be about 143,000. And at a 77 degree temperature rise, I can get about 3.7 gallons of hot water. Okay. And this is also a priority mode. So when I look at combi boilers, this is what I, I start to look at and I start to deal with. Uh, one other thing about this 77 degree rise, the other thing that I often talk about when somebody says combi is what's your groundwater temperature? You know, I can get 3.7 degree rise on a, with a, a 77 degree rise at 3.7 gallons per minute. But if I'm at nor up in Northern New England, where the groundwater temperature is running around 36, 37 degrees, I may have to scale back that 3.7 to maybe 3.3 or 3.2 so that I can, I can scale this back to open that up to give them the right water temperature. So that also is one of the discussion points. When we say, let's do a combi boiler and we're looking at what's the right application for it, okay? So combi boiler, domestic hot water is produced from a plate heat exchanger. Talked a little about this earlier. If I look at my maximum flow rate, the maximum flow rate is based on the firing input. So if I'm at 100 and, and the input's 150,000 BTUs, I'm generally about 3.4 to maybe 3.7, depending on the temperature rise. The input's around 199,000. I can get up to four gallons per minute at about a 90 degree rise. So that is really what I am going to get out of it. On the minimum size, the minimum flow rate, it's really based on, first off, there's gonna be a, a flow switch in there to fire it. It's normally gonna be set at about a half to maybe three quarters of a GPM. And a lot of this is tied to the minimum firing rate of the boiler. So I gotta, if I'm gonna do a half a gallon a minute, I have to get down to about 20,000 BTUs per hour to produce that kind of water flow rate. So that does play into it as well. And again, Based on this and this, you know, typically when I do domestic hot water through a combi, you know, particularly when I'm looking for the, the higher, higher inputs for maximum, I start to look for a much higher turn down ratio to get where I need to be for my minimum flow rate. Now, when I start to look at the, the storage water heater, I have a tank of water heater here. Let's call it a 42 gallon tank, okay? Now from this store 42 gallon storage tank, I have water to draw against, so there is no minimum flow rate required because I'm not firing the, the boiler. I'm drawing against the volume of that water heater. Additionally, because I don't have a maximum flow rate that I have to worry about, there really isn't a maximum flow rate associated with the water heater. Maximum flow rate really comes down to you know, the piping connection coming in and out of the tank, what's the restriction there, and the associated piping as well. You know, over here, I may be limited to four gallons per minute with my combi boiler. I can have a 42 gallon tank and deliver six gallons a minute if necessary. So I can exceed what I think I need for short periods of time because of the volume of water that's available. The indirect water heater gives you flexibility in delivery. Okay. Now, a couple other things that come into the design of the water heater that helps from that flexibility standpoint. You know, I really don't, I want to minimize the number of times the boiler is cycling to maintain temperature in the indirect water heater or to keep up with the water heater demand as needed. So a couple of things come into this. I want to maximize the amount of usable hot water in here. So when I look at tank design, usually there'll be something in the bottom that diffuses the water coming in to maintain stratification in the tank. Depending on how this is designed, the usable hot water in the tank can go anywhere from 75% of the tank's volume. So when we looked at the numbers for the 119 gallon tank, it was greater than 99% usable hot water. 
and it's about minimizing the turbulence and min maintaining that stratification. But if I'm doing a 42 gallon tank here, for instance, I have 35 gallons of usable hot water available to me. Additionally, when I'm using that hot water, it's not where I start to draw the hot water and the boiler immediately fires. Over here, I have my well with my sensor. The sensor comes down about halfway in the tank. So in that halfway position, I can use about 50% of the tank's volume before the boiler comes on. So it takes a lot of draw, a lot of hot water usage before the boiler is actually gonna fire. So that means I got about 21 gallons of usable hot water. When the boiler comes on, I still have about 15 gallons of usable hot water still to make my way through. So it, it holds it off, it delivers the hot water, and then when it starts to recover, there's still water available. Now, if I look at these two numbers, and I come back and look at some of these typical usage, and I'm gonna actually focus here on the shower, okay? So if I'm taking a shower, I'm using anything, and I have a combi boiler, that combi boiler comes on and it fires. But if I have a storage type water heater, when we'll go with that 42 gallon, let's go with the smaller size one, 42 gallon water heater, and I have 20 gallons to work against, the boiler's not gonna fire until I use 21 gallons of hot water. So I can take, one person can take the typical shower and the boiler never fires because I'm drawing up against that storage. And when that shower is done, they still have 15 gallons of usable hot water, okay? In fact, if I look at that 35 gallon number, you know, I am pretty close to actually being able to get two full showers out of that tank's volume. So when I start to do a, um, a storage type water heater, one of the great features that it does is it utilizes the boiler to heat the hot water, but it doesn't cycle the boiler nearly as much as a combi does to keep up with the hot water demand. Now, a lot of times we look at these numbers, the question always comes about, about recovery, okay? If I do a 94,000 BTU input boiler, let's call it 89,000 out, and I use, just take one shower, I use 20 gallons of water, and let's say after that shower, the boiler goes into recovery mode. It will take about nine minutes for that boiler to now reheat that 20 gallons of cold water that just came in. And a lot of times people say, I do a combi because I have continuous use. It's a continuous number. Continuous is not how we use water. And showers happen to be probably the high demand item in the house as far as repetition during the course of that peak hour. And the thing is when you take a shower, it's not where somebody jumps in the shower, the minute they get out of that shower, somebody jumps up into it behind them. Somebody comes in, they get ready. It's probably, let's call it five minutes before you actually get in the shower. You get out of the shower, you dry off, you put on clothes and then you walk out. So if you're doing continuous operation in the shower, you probably have at least eight, nine, 10 minutes between the shower. With this kind of performance here, you know, you take a shower, by the time some, if I use 20 gallons and that boiler came on, by the time the next shower started, I'm back up to 35 gallons, 40 gallons of usable hot water. So when I start to look at a combi boiler versus an indirect water heater, the storage, a lot of times, which is presented as a negative, actually is a very big positive when you look at the way that we use hot water, okay? Now, one of the other negatives that tends to be thrown in the direction of an indirect water heater is about the fact that I have a tank of water hit sitting there warm in the basement of the house, losing heat because I don't use that hot water 24 hours a day. The thing is with water heaters, the water heaters are always well insulated, okay? Now, again, I'm gonna, I always tend to stick with the 42 as the, the one, the tank that I talk about when I talk about uh, indirect style water heaters versus uh, combi boilers. But if you look at that 42 gallon tank, the heat loss off that tank is 127 BTUs per hour. 127 BTUs per hour. That represents a heat loss of about 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So the question always comes up about the heat loss and the number of times that boiler needs to cycle if there's no demand to maintain tank temperature. If I look at that 0.7 degrees per hour and I look at your standard control with somewhere between probably a nine to a 10 degree differential from when it recovers to when it's satisfied, based on a no draw condition, just sitting there in the, board, the mechanical room of your house, your basement, the tank needs to be recovered every 13 hours. 
Okay, so that's not a whole lot of recovery. If nobody's using hot water, that's about twice a day it recovers. Now, if I look at recovering this 127 degrees per hour, I look at the energy that's needed. If I take 127 degrees, I multiply that by 24 hours, the tank is wasting 3,048 BTUs per day, okay? Now let's take that and change it to something more meaningful. Let's talk money. So assuming that a therm of natural gas costs a buck and a quarter, to maintain that tank hot 24 hours a day costs about four cents a day. So it's very minimal, the amount of energy that's being wasted because of the level of insulation. But again, this is one that usually when somebody talks about an indirect water heater and the pros and cons, you know, the fact that the tank is standing there holding hot water is usually put out as a, a con. You'll notice the number with, with a well-insulated tank, the, the, the amount of energy spent and the money spent is, is, is minimal. Now, a question came up about this ease earlier, and I, I will give you, I'm gonna give you, unfortunately, I don't have the formula on the top of my, my tongue that was asked for, but the question always becomes, what if I come up short? So if I have a combi boiler with a plate heat exchanger, size exactly for the installation, and somebody says, can I increase the performance? The answer is no. What you get is what you get. So if I have a hundred and, uh, 199,000 BTU input boiler putting out 180,000, I'm gonna get 44 gallons per minute at a 90 degree rise, no more. There's no way to extend the performance out. But if I go to a tank style water heater, the answer is yes. So let's say I do a tank style water heater, and let's say I'm storing at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And the for, for whatever reason, they seem to run out of water, hot water, a little bit earlier than they, they would like. And the question becomes, well, is there any way to squeeze out any more performance? The answer is absolutely. Let's not store at 120 degrees. Let's increase it to 140, maybe 145 degrees. And as the person pointed out in their question earlier, if I'm gonna bring this up to 140 to 145 degrees, please install an ASSE 1070 rated, maybe no, 1017 rated mixing valve, a point of use, point of storage mixing valve to ensure nobody in the building gets scalded. But I raise that tank temperature up to 100 to 145. I've increased the tank drawdown by about 20%. You know, so the 35 gallons of drawdowns are going to become closer to probably about 44 gallons, 43 to 44 gallons. So I can extend it a little bit further by stirring hot and then mixing out to it. Unfortunately, off the top of my head, I can't remember the formula, but um, you know, what'll happen is when I put together the answer to the question, I'll throw it in there. So again, another big advantage of, of, of what I can do with, uh, with a storage type tank, okay? Questions come up about recirculation. Domestic hot water with this tank style water heater? Absolutely, I can do recirculation because I can recirculate off of the volume of the tank. And then what'll happen is it'll just increase the frequency that the, the boiler runs and recovers um, the water heater. Now over here, if I do a combi uh, for domestic hot water recirculation, I can recirculate, but the problem is whenever that pump is running, the boiler is now shifted over to domestic hot water priority and shut the space heating down. So I certainly can't, have a system where that pump runs 24 hours a day. You know, I'm gonna take that pump, I'm gonna put it on an aquastat and it's gonna cycle. So, you know, it, what'll happen is when the pump comes on, the boiler goes into priority, generates domestic hot water, it'll run until that aquastat is satisfied, shuts the pump off, and then it does it again. How often? Depends on the size of the pipe, the run, and how much it's insulated. If my recirculation, if my distribution and recirculation is well insulated, it might recover every hour to uh, let's call it an hour and 20 minutes, okay? If the piping's uninsulated, it may be every 20 minutes to 30 minutes. But, all, but what happens is with this recirculation, all of a sudden you bring in extra cycles to maintain the, um, the hot water distribution at temperature through the recirculation. Now, a uh, final point I wanna make is about delivery pressure. 
Now, when I start to look at convy boilers, typically it's a it's a, some sort of plate heat exchanger that I'm passing the water through. So you end up with a pressure drop curve of something like this on the domestic water side. So when I start to look at flow rates, if I'm taking a single shower, I'm sitting somewhere about right here, somewhere probably around 1.8 to two gallons per minute. At that level, the pressure drop across the heat exchanger is about three PSI, very minimal. So one person's in there, they take a shower, three PSI, great water pressure in the house. Second person jumps in, they start to take a shower. Now all of a sudden my flow rate goes from 1.8 gallons per minute up to about 3.7. My pressure goes from about three, pressure drop goes from about three PSI up to about 21.5 PSI. The person in that first shower all of a sudden sees the amount of water coming out of this shower head start to reduce. So when I start to look at doing combi boilers and I start to look at high flow rates, high flow rates a lot of times are associated with a high pressure drop. So it is something you have to be consider, you have to consider. And this is also one of the reasons back to why I say, you know, I like to see it with a bath, a bath and a half. I do a bath or a bath and a half. I'm operating all the time down here, very low pressure drop across that, that heat exchanger. Conversely, I do a tank style heat exchanger. You'll notice over here is my pressure drop. Here's my flow rate. Minimum flow rate that even comes into consideration is 4.4 gallons per minute. So whether I'm doing one shower or I'm doing two showers, the pressure drop across the tank is minimal, you know, less than 3.3 feet. The performance at the shower from a pressure standpoint stays the same whether I have one shower two showers or two showers in a bathtub even running. It gives me a much more consistent pressure when I start to do that tank style. So, covered a lot of ground. Okay. The final piece of ground, we're gonna talk money. Okay. If I'm doing a boiler with a combi, usually everybody looks at this and says, you know, the price of that has to be a lot more than the price of doing a boiler with a um, an integral heat exchanger or combi unit. Okay. Now, um, I didn't price adjust here based on what I would see for 199,000 BTU one. But if I looked at some of our numbers, and those are the numbers I had to work with with our numbers. If I look at doing a combi boiler versus doing a heating boiler with indirect water heater, we'll call it 42 gallon stainless steel. In the package, the sensors included, the controls included, and the integral pump works both for the, the boiler loop pump and also the domestic pump. List price wise, that's about a $500 add on the list price side of things. So when you start to look at upselling features and selling what the indirect with the, the combi, you know, for somebody that's a good salesman or an average salesman, $500 list adder over, over a piece of equipment that you're expecting to last at least 20 years, yeah, a lot of times is an easy sale to make. But again, when we start to look at going with the, the boiler with the indirect versus the combi unit, the, the, the price increase is not a major jump when you look at a project that you're expecting to last for a, a, long, a long life cycle. So comparing the two, you know, or back to my thing where I said, why, you know, why an indirect? It's the highly effective method of heating domestic hot water. And rather than reading this, you know, I gotta just say, it brings a lot of positives to the table. We start to look at the methodology of, of heating the water. Now, this is not to say that the, the combi boiler is fully discounted. Combi boiler has its place in there and there's places that only a combi boiler can work. But when I start to get into houses like I, I used as our, our reference project, four bedrooms, two and a half baths. Yeah. All of a sudden I start to look at the what that project represents and the, the indirect water heater is usually the, the more intelligent choice for that style of, of load. And I will say that with the exception of the third option, the storage tank loading system, okay? So the storage tank loading system is another style and it, we, we could call it a combi boiler but it's a very unique approach to it. So it's a standalone, a floor standing model. It has integral domestic hot water production and storage coupled with 
a fully modulating condensing boiler. Now, what we mean by storage tank loading systems, it's not an indirect with a coil, okay? Internally, there is a tank. It's a 26-gallon storage tank, no coil on the inside of it. Domestic hot water is produced like I would in a combi boiler through a plate heat exchanger utilizing a domestic hot water loading pump and a boiler pump, and also a three-way diverting valve to shift between space heating to domestic hot water heating. Like an indirect, there is gonna be a tank sensor. Like a combi boiler, there is gonna be a domestic hot water loading sensor. The tank sensor is the sensor that starts the process off. The loading sensor is what modulates and maintains water temperature. Now what's unique about this is the water is actually, hot water is coming into the top of the tank and it's all about stratification. We're going to bring the water in and load the tank from the top to the bottom when the boiler is running in a domestic hot water load. And the outlet to domestic hot water is up here as well, which gives me great performance. Because from a performance standpoint, if I stratify the tank, here's, and when the water comes into the, the hot water comes in from the, from the, the hot water generation, it's bringing it into the top of the tank, which I'm drawing against. So what that gives me from a performance standpoint is typically, the, um, the combi boiler normally is all about production. Here I have 26 gallons of water to draw against, but this also gives me instantaneous production of hot water to supplement it. So with this, I can do a, a very large amount of hot water in a very short period of time because of the way that I get this combination of, of performance. So cold water will come in, it can come into the bottom of the tank, or it can come into the heat exchanger, or it can come into both. So um, initially, we're going to run off the storage of the tank until this number five sensor sees the water temperature. When that temperature comes, kicks in, it brings on the boiler, it starts the pumps, it shifts the valve over, and it starts to produce hot water. So that hot water comes in here. And if the demand is greater than what is coming out here, which is gonna be about 3.3 gallons per minute, then I will continue to produce hot water, but also draw off the storage. So this will really, out of all the methods, this is gonna give you the best performance over, let's call it a 10 minute period of generation. 60 gallons of domestic hot water in 10 minutes because of this combined performance, okay? And what it does is it gives me hot water faster than doing a conventional tank. Because on the conventional tank size, when I start to heat the water up, it's not that I heat a portion of the water up, only a, a segment of the water up to temperature. I actually set up a convection current in here and then the entire tank heats up together. So if I start with a cold tank, over a 10 minute period, eventually the tank temperature as a tank starts to increase and increases fairly consistently throughout the tank. With this system, when I fire this up to make hot water, it dumps water into the top of the tank and it stays stratified. So on minute zero, I may have no hot water in the tank at all. After two minutes, I have about six gallons of hot water in that tank ready for use. So I can turn this on and like a combi immediately, if I don't exceed how much hot water it can produce, I could keep that tank almost all cold with a thin layer of hot water and be able to provide hot water out to the, the building. And then as the time goes by, it starts to load that tank up. So the end result is with this style of system, it's a single footprint, single device, but it gives me a lot of hot water because of this storage tank loading system, which gives me performance much better than a lot much larger storage tanks. From a performance standpoint over 10 minutes, I can get about 60 gallons of usable hot water from the storage tank coupled with the heat exchanger's performance as well. So you won't find that number, that kind of number out of anything out of that, this size, you know, out of 125,000 input piece of, of appliance. And when I, when the tank is all exhausted, I still can draw at 3.3 gallons per minute based on a 70 degree rise. So it gives me a great combination package for very specific applications. You know, for instance, back to that two and a half bedroom house, this also could be a very viable option for that in addition to doing the boiler and 
the indirect water heater. So it is an option to, to think about in that size, okay? So talked about three different options. Here's our learning objectives for a quick review. You know, contrasting the differences between an indirect water heater and a combi boiler, compare the sizing procedures, going over the pros and cons of both, and then throwing in that third option, you know, about how the domestic hot water storage tank loading system works. Uh, we did go a little bit over. Uh, let's see if we have a couple of questions uh, before we wrap it up. Miranda, looks like we have none. No questions right now, Jody. So I'm going to say thank you all for attending. Hopefully you found the, the presentation um, informative. And, you know, in, in my world, this is it's a common discussion when somebody says, hey, Jody, what do, do I, which way should I go with my water heating? This is my discussion with somebody about which direction they should go for a, a residential type water heating. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Miranda. Great. Thank you, Jody. Just a few reminders before we close out. As stated in the beginning, a recorded version of this webinar will be posted on the video library within the next two weeks, so you will be able to go back and rewatch this webinar at that time. The PDH certificates for those who selected yes when registering will be emailed out to you within the next five business days. As a reminder, just make sure you fill out that mandated survey that will be emailed out to you in the, by the end of today. If you um, don't remember if you selected the PDH uh, certificate option on the registration form, my email is on the screen right now. Feel free to email me to double check, as well as any additional questions that you may have. We will be putting together a document with all of the questions and anything that comes in. Jody will be putting in his answers and we will send it out to everyone who attended today. We do have a bunch of new webinars coming up in the month of May, so I do hope to see you attend one or more of those. And of course, keep an eye out on our website for more webinar opportunities and hopefully soon in-person training as well in our Warwick facility. With that being said, that concludes our webinar today. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful day.